You may remember that a few weeks ago we asked you to fill in some sheets of paper with awkward questions. You remember that? And we're starting to try and pick them up as we go forward. And so I'm going to answer the question, the question, one of the questions that was written down for us was, does God punish people for the bad things that they do? That sort of fits with this story a bit, doesn't it? Does God punish people for the bad things that they do? Now, let's be clear, this passage does not actually say that God killed either of them. But it's sort of implied that their disobedience, their lying to the Holy Spirit, was the cause of their death. It doesn't overtly say that, but it's sort of implied, isn't it? So let's have a look and think of the subject. How does God relate to people and, 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 and what's the process of punishment and justice and all this sort of stuff? So I want to give you three levels in which I think God operates. The first is the strategic level that God punishes people, not as a punishment. Now, we think of punishment as a slap across the wrists, you know, were you caned in school, were you sent to detention, did you have your pocket money withdrawn, you know, the kind of privileges withdrawn and all the rest of it. God, I believe, primarily sees disobedience as something which cannot enter his presence. Sin cannot enter his presence. We see that in Genesis. The principle there was when Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? They were separated from God. And we see it in final judgment. You see it um, in, 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 in some of the parables that Jesus taught. You see it in the book of Revelation. When Jesus comes again and there is the final judgment of mankind, what happens? There is a separation. The goats from the sheep. The wheat from the chaff. A separation. And the prime punishment that God had, in inverted commas, punishment, from God has for us is simply that separation we are separated for eternity because of what we do wrong he doesn't hit us across the back he doesn't fire a gun at us he doesn't whip us he doesn't do anything else he simply separates himself because god is holy and sin cannot compromise his holiness and his purity so it is pushed away so primarily god in inverted commas punishes by separation the second way to look at this is to think of God as a father and how fathers and parents have that responsibility to bring their children up. And they don't just throw them out the door when they do something wrong, they actually do something to correct. And that's maybe where your privileges come in and they're withdrawn for a time or whatever. But parents do positively chastise and try to correct and discipline. And there's a sense in which God does that with us particularly once we have given our life to Christ, because we are given the status of children. John chapter 1 says, if you believed in his name, if you received him into your life, then you have the right to be called a child of God. And if you're a child of God, that means God is your father. So I believe that there is that sense of discipline and God correct us. So I want you to turn, if you want to, you can turn to, I will read it out, Hebrews chapter 12. It's on page 1211 in your books. Uh, 1211. Hebrews 12 verse 7. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. 
Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so the lame may not be disabled, but rather be healed. So sometimes God comes into our lives and something hurts. We go through a difficult period. It's a struggle. But we have to see that as punishment, is what this passage is saying. It's about the Father allowing things to, to happen to us, which challenge us in order that we may be corrected and disciplined and strengthened and may grow. So not all life's problems, all life's problems are a pain in the backside, but not all problems are spiritually a pain in the backside. We have to look at them in the sense of what is God teaching me here? What is God doing with me? And it draws us to depend upon him rather than our own strength when we begin to recognise that process. So punishment and things going wrong in our lives may often seem like a punishment for what we've done, and we speculate about that. But actually, this passage tells us that God uses things to discipline us and to encourage us to grow and to depend on him more. And the third thing level at which God operates, so he operates strategically in terms of separation because of his nature of holiness. He operates as a father in terms of discipline us when we do things that are wrong. The third level is that he is at work in the world. A passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, the power of lawlessness is already at work. That's a reference to the devil. But the one who holds it back will continue to do so. Evil is in the world. We know that. Again, we go back to Genesis. The devil was banished from God's presence. And unfortunately, we were banished because of our sin. So we are in the presence of evil in this world. And we only need to look at the, news, uh, at the television screen today to understand how that evil manifests itself. And Halloween. And Halloween. And Halloween. Good point. Okay. But God, it says in Thessalonians, holds it back. And I get this impression, therefore, that what God is doing is he's stopping, he's saving the world from the true manifestation of Ill, evil until the final times. And Roland, funnily enough, mentioned that in one of his comments earlier on about the final times. You're hearing of rumours of wars. You look at Matthew 24 and read it, and it's a very dark, difficult passage to read. And then you can read some of like Revelation 17, and again, you have a very dark passage to read. It's about the final confrontation of evil and goodness, which God wins. But up until that point, that force of evil is muted by the presence of God in the world. And I find that an encouragement because God wants more and more people to be saved. By holding back evil, there is more and more opportunity and time for us to share the good news with other people that they may come to the point of salvation. 